So what uh, what we want to talk today, or what I want to, to talk, is about Moonlight architecture, which will be pretty general. So basically, it will kind of uh, contain, yeah, not only architecture, but also sort of uh, all kind of general uh, considerations why we're doing what we're doing. Right. So this is basically the, the kind of very conceptual architecture that usually we use to describe what Nunet is in terms of layers in, in a general computational universe, whatever we call it. So basically, we are layered between the hardware and the software. That's it. And we have the software, we have all kind of peer-to-peer -peer decentralized distributed, et etc. Et proprietary algorithms, data, proprietary data, open algorithms, and so on and so on. And what we're building, we're building the location, context, awareness, and mobility of the of the of those algorithms in the hardware and the tokenomics to yeah, like to compensate for the not only for the hardware, but also for the algorithms to each other and for the algorithm for the data. To data while it's not exactly our primary kind of mission or of technology what we're building but basically we're taking this into account because it's kind of the same and i will just explain why it is the same why it could be kind of seen as the same but okay so so basically the, the, if we talk uh, we start from we have a bunch of machines and each machine has a description in terms of what kind of capabilities it has how much of those capabilities so let's say hardware a user wants to give to nunet and that is that is all uh, held as a metadata description of a machine and so our goal is to sort of make these descriptions based on user preferences who have our own machine and to make them available in the network for for now just that available in the network so that everybody who wants to run something could access, or maybe not everybody, it depends on security, but basically that this metadata should be accessible. Uh, well, there are, there are other things, um, uh, well, but let's, let's start from there. Then we have a bunch of algorithms. Here it's sort of written as net algorithms. It doesn't need to be as net algorithms. Let's say it's just computational uh, tasks that need to run. And we again have a bunch of them. Uh, we can say computational task, AI agent, or just an algorithm. And we basically also have metadata descriptions on those algorithms describing what kind of environment they need, uh, how much computational power they need, if that's possible to estimate. What is, uh, I mean, yeah, in, in, the, in the execution metadata of execution environments, we also have a cost. How much does that cost, each, each machine and each environment? for time or whatever whatever parameters we choose to use uh, and here we have basically requirements for the for the um, for the environments and also what is the preferred price for, for the environment or at least ability to communicate this price to each other and to negotiate on the price and the, 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 the final the ultimate goal is to enable the negotiation between these all components uh, based on the hard preferences, which is either I can run there or I cannot run there, or on the soft preferences, for example, I sort of like this machine better than that one, and one of those soft references is the price. So we want to, all these metadata descriptions are in order to enable this information to flow and to for, for, for the algorithm to negotiate to each other, uh, these components, let's say this for now. And the end goal of all this stuff is to be able to dynamically construct uh, basically backend of, 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 of any, uh, any application and what we need for that apart from the metadata of machines and algorithms, single algorithms and apart from the ability to match those, those sort of machines and algorithms and to be able to deploy them, we also need the specification of the, let's say, connections between the algorithms. And then uh, the, the end goal, in order to run certain backend of, uh, of application, well, it's not exactly end goal, but uh, so that the platform should be able to dynamically construct those workflows, deploy them, and to enable the communication between them as defined in the program graph. So program graph is basically, it's a kind of um, computing graph or decent, whoa, what is it called? Directed graph. Uh, where we simply say 
what kind of uh, algorithm, what kind of services should be called. So basically, it defines the uh, the whole backend of 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 an application. So the example here is uh, graph, the simple graph of the fake um, news warning application, and also the kind of graphical representation of that. What what it what how does it look when when this backend is is deployed on the on the net? Uh, and what the platform does is basically yeah construct those 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 those, those sub networks uh do with them what is needed for to answer the call to a user and just destroy them after after they're done so as a platform we can say that the, the new net is hardware software mesh for running computational workflows of an application by dynamically constructing them uh, so which means that we want to have the dynamic deployment load balancing and scaling up and down of those workflows based on the actual like uh, calls uh, to to the back backend calls. So and this this picture is supposed to to show that we can have the same uh, the same let's say sub network scaled up and scaled down depending on the needs. So we have many many relationships between machines and services, which just you can have the same service. Let's say I mean one thousand instances of the same service if we need to scale it up. And then they will run on, on on another number of machines, which could be cannot be less than one thousand, but can cannot be more than one thousand, but can be less. And that also depends on whether these algorithms implement multi-threading or asynchronous kind of running themselves. Uh, right. So so that that enables us basically by by default when we have this this kind of ability, it enables us to do the load balancing and scaling up and down automatically in the platform. And the only thing that we will need to take care of is having enough computational power and to check whether there are, I mean, to check all kind of parameters that are needed for the, for the, for the application, let's say, latencies and, and uh, response times and so on and so Now, and of course, since, since this, there is many to many relationships, so in theory, we can run uh, the, let's say, it could be that there is a application backend defined as, uh, as this, uh, let's say, graph. It could be more complex than this. Hopefully, it will. And every algorithm will be owned by a different, let's say, entity. And every machine can be on which those algorithms runs can be owned by a different agent, uh, entity. And then we basically synchronize the ability for the users or the application developers or application yeah developers who uh, who offer this to users to pay directly to all the machines and algorithms by a yeah, new network economic system. Uh, in terms of the prices of computing and prices, let's let's keep let's say prices of the of the algorithms and so apart. Uh, but prices of computing. Uh, so since we build it on top of metadata, which is defined on for each container or for each machine separately, uh, in the end of the day we want those machines to be able to negotiate prices. Uh, so our our let's say the the, the um, fundamentals that we have to put together in order to achieve that is pretty much what we call tokenomics API and the ability for the this information about uh, capabilities of machines, uh, ability to run certain algorithms and prices to flow back and forth and to enable negotiation between the algorithms and machines. Uh, and yeah, the, using different devices, execution environments, different algorithms will need different devices. And we want to build the, the platform itself as rich as possible with different devices so that pretty much anything that we come up with in terms of backend can run on top of that. Uh, so I may run a little bit ahead of myself. I'm not sure this is written anywhere, but machines doesn't mean just a plain desktop. Uh, at certain point, I mean, capabilities is not just CPU or RAM or, or whatever this. Capabilities also include sensors. So, for example, there, there will be mobile phones which will have location centers. There will be whatever I don't know uh, cameras which will have which will have uh, video streams. Uh, there could be temperature, all kind of basically what's called IoT. Uh, from the perspective of the kind of conceptual architecture, it's not exactly different whether there is an algorithm which calculates something and outputs uh, and sort of sends output as a result of computation, or it has a sensor 
where it detects something in the environment and sends it back as a response. Therefore, when we build ability to exchange information between the, let's say, algorithms running on machines, basically we cover the case of uh, exchanging data, not only the results of computations. So therefore, I do not really emphasize too much about, I mean, do not really philosophize too much, hopefully, but basically uh, we cover that. And this is this is in the in the in the back of of, 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 of the mind of our minds when we design the design the platform, which may or may not be an important aspect or important use cases that we will start building on the, on on, on the uh, So what Nunet as a platform does is it takes all those soft and hard constraints of machines, algorithms, and their capabilities, and basically tries to search appropriate machines for appropriate devices and appropriate algorithms. So searches and matches them and constructs those workflows which end up allowing for uh, users to get response to the calls, whatever those calls are. At the, at the bottom, I mean, at the, at the low level, it's just data flowing around. And we are most, I mean, we are on the platform level, we are not just that concerned about what exactly data flows, but we're concerned on the any data can flow based on the requirements of a user and we're concerned on latencies, security, encryption, and the fact that actually the data reaches where it can reach and also ability for people to debug all these things in a decentralized system. Uh, and we are using uh, use case integrations that we have a few now in order to basically come up with that. Yeah. Now, in terms of architecture, what Basically, uh, the, uh, it's not something that uh, one can find, I think, on Google this term, but basically the best way to uh, explain the, what we are building, we're building decentralized hardware software mesh, and there will be quite a few concepts sort of glued on, on that to, to explain things. So I will just throw, well, not just throw, I will, uh, I will uh, name a list of concepts and then explain them. They are pretty much connected conceptually, but sometimes they, they, they kind of may look a little bit loosely collected. However, they're not. So what we want to do, we want to, on the architectural perspective, we want to implement all of them. Now, it's not that they are all, uh, this, I mean, important in the same way, but we want to do sort of, and when, when we're talking about concrete issues, why we're doing things this way or not that way, we pretty much, uh, sort of uh, all those decisions are based on those principles as much as possible and then we see whether we can implement those principles immediately or whether do, do we need to sort of uh, have kind of a temporary solution which may not implement them ideally or the way we want but at least it's stepped over that but basically all those kind of structures are related to those principles now from the business perspective what we're doing, we're doing economy of hardware, software, and data. So it's a kind of multi-market marketplace of hardware, software, and data. Uh, and those principles are, okay, these are listed. So autonomy of hardware, software, agent nodes. Autonomy means that basically we look at each piece of hardware and each piece of software as some kind of agent which has autonomous decision whether to, how to run itself and what to run. It's not complete autonomy because otherwise we become artificial intelligent, but basically we look at it as a separate modules, which means there is no kind of uh, entity which orchestrates everything from the global perspective, or at least this is the concept. So from the computational perspective, what we are using, I mean, the many things that we're doing are based on actual model of computation, pretty, pretty directly. Then we are implementing computational reflection. We are implementing decentralized searching and matching, what I mentioned between the software and hardware. Serverless workflow orchestration. Uh, P2P communication security, something that Dagim was presenting last week. Uh, uh, well, he, he was presenting the actual implementations that we are doing now, mostly with this uh, by book IPv8. Uh, but that's, I mean, that's related. Uh, decentralized ownership and pseudonymous identity, and what is called API of APIs, which is something that is pretty much 
describes again how how, how we are going to implement all those. Um, it's both a concept and the way to make these things work. Let's say in a decentralized uh, environment. So what is actor model? An actor model is a mathematical model of concurrent computation, where an actor is a universal primitive of concurrent computation, uh, which so basically the whole computation is done by actors doing something and sending the messages to each other. So the, the framework itself is basically a bunch of actors which can communicate, and that's pretty much it. So what actors can do, actors can make local decisions, which local decision basically means to run certain code inside of themselves without any access to any, any environment. Then send messages to other actors. I mean, first of all, they can receive messages. Then based on, the, the, on those messages, then can, can run certain code, which is sort of RPC calls. Then they can send messages to other actors. Then they can create more actors just by issuing yeah message to to some to some another actor which will uh well basically you can implement a framework where each actor can create another actor which is actually which means the deployment of certain services can be triggered by other services without any global like orchestrator uh, and then they can they can have state which means they can de they can uh, determine how to respond to the next message that is uh, that is received, and that's pretty much it. There is no other guarantees except of these uh, these four things, uh, as as per the, the the model. And actors can modify their own state, but they cannot affect any I mean uh, any other states of the of the actors except just sending a message and waiting for an answer. Without without, I mean, they can actually decide to lock themselves until they get an answer, but basically this doesn't lock the whole system. And usually you don't even do that. You do asynchronous messaging, which means actors do not wait for messages. You lose certain uh, guarantees, which, which sort of uh, conventional computing models like to do. However, what you gain, you gain quite a bit of stuff and you, yeah, there is no, there is no problem of log-based synchronization. And so what we can see as an actor is, so you have uh, algorithm encapsulated in whatever, whatever way we do, let's say container. Those, this container has certain functions that it can implement. It has certain state that it always have and can sort of have a memory. And then it gets inputs and it produces outputs. And on the platform level, we don't care what actors actually do inside. What we care is how that correct inputs come so that actors can do whatever they do and correct outputs go out for other actors to do whatever they instructed them to do and this is uh, the kind of the main view of uh, let's say of the platform what the what the moon as a platform does and now computational reflection is simply a way to express that algorithms can uh, uh, so an actor, so what is an actor in terms of MUNET? An actor is actually, every node is, is, is considered an actor. So the hardware device is an actor, the algorithm is an actor, the co uh, container is an actor, and data source is an actor. So yeah, everything we look at from the actor model as an actor, which is having inputs, which we have to formulate correctly, and is having output, which we have to formulate also correctly and to, to pipe where they need to be. Uh, so, Basically, every actor is built with as much as possible autonomous kind of as an as an autonomous agent, which has its identity and which has autonomy to decide what to do. This autonomy can be quite algorithmic, but basically nobody decides for others what I mean. For example, an algorithm should be able to decide for itself where it has to run based on all kind of parameters and maybe calculation. Uh, yeah, so each software company computational job is autonomous in the sense that they can choose the hardware to run on and having access to the execution properties and the, the ex execution environment, which basically to understand the hardware on which it's running to some extent. And the hardware, on the same way, it has to be able to say on what software it can run and basically wants to run because there are also soft preferences. 
and also to have certain access to uh, runtime properties, properties of this algorithm, for example, how much computing power it has used. So that is computational refraction, which means there is a kind of certain blurring between the hardware and software. Uh, now the new net, uh, what's the network of actors is called actor network. Uh, I believe I have another half an hour, right? Uh, let me check the time. Yes. Uh, yes. So basically, so from all those actors, what we uh, then we, we have we have a bunch of uh, the kind of differently configured sub networks which are configured ad hoc based on the need of uh, calls or these program descriptions of the backends that are running. So what Luna does, Luna just enables these things to get defined, uh, execute them, and properly destruct them in order to free the resources both. Uh, software resources and hardware resources in order for the other uh, ad hoc networks, sub networks to get formed and to sort of uh, do the next, uh, I mean, uh, do the next computational work that is needed by users. Uh, so now, as I said, application backends themselves, they are described as a directed uh, acyclic graphs of uh, of so basically these are three graphs which are actually so the two graphs the first and second is uh kind of descriptions of these lines that you see on on this graph of two because here there are two kind of backends described so this this that's pretty much describes those backends uh, and the third one is uh, fake news warning applications back which describes how it runs uh, which, I mean, simply speaking, you just say that the, the, the call from, uh, from the front end, which actually also could be an actor in the NuNet network, therefore I just kind of made this, this, this picture. Basically, we can draw the line below the front ends and to say that this, this line shows the boundary between the like, internet, external internet, and the internal NuNet network. But in principle, we can do front ends and use a user sort of. Um, uh, yeah, user interfaces within, within the network, within the net. Uh, right. So let's say if, if I look at the, the right, uh, the, the back, which is on the right, this is what it means that uh, a call from, uh, from in that case, is like a okay, GUI or whatever front end, it goes to a container which is called new score. Then this new score container, it splits it makes calls to two further containers or two further let's say ai services whatever they're called which is called usmlp and binary classification all these three are actors defined as, as i mean within the set actors. so what we need to in order to this for to work we just need to uh prove that those input make sense in the in the in the sort of uh, in context of those actors and that the correct responses Sort of get, get back. So, and when new score gets a response from binary classification, it gets a response from USMLP, it gets a, some, some sort of algorithm where it, uh, with, where it com combines the, the two results, and then it sends response to the uh, front end. And it all works pretty much like this. What NUNET has to be able to do is to see whether there is such a thing running and it's free to uh, serve the, the request and if it's not free it has to deploy all these algorithms on the fly it's a little bit more complicated because for example uh, certain uh, certain calls may ask certain uh, will, may have certain latency requirements however the point to take is that uh, since the platform the, the, the kind of the principle of building the platform is that even the platform components are actors and the, like uh, they are actors of the same uh, what's called level of citizenship which means even the the, the um, let's say certain uh, orchestrator actors which will uh, figure out what kind of uh, what, let's say find different algorithms and figure out how to deploy them they will use the same apis in order to do this there will not be any or at least this is a goal. 
Now, there will be technical problems while doing this, but the goal is to use the same API that every actor is using in order to enable uh, all the actors in the network to deploy algorithms and to call other actors and to do all kind of system level, um, let's say, orchestration. Uh, and the goal of all this is to have uh, what, 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 what is called the uh, serverless decentralized orchestration, which means that we do not run everything on, on a server. Uh, we will have those algorithms or containers, or AI, or AI, let's say containers, because now we are doing container orchestration. We'll have those containers somewhere in the repositories where each agent will be able to access them and to tell to other agents, please pull it, run it, and do the work that I just sent you with the, with the, with the let's say, remote procedure. Well, like with the message that you just received. And these things should be accessible to, in principle, to everybody. That doesn't mean that it will not be based with, on security because there will be security constraints. But if there are no security constraints, these things should be available for each actor in the network. And serverless, which means that if there is no call, then nothing is running, that the execution environment is free, unless there are certain uh, requirements for, let's say, latency, which, which requires to run small amount of, of, of let's say, actors, which would, which would immediately respond to a call. Uh, in a, so the word, I think I have explained somewhere, but uh, so serverless, which means that all the all the servers and all the algorithms are waiting somewhere in the registry, waiting until they get deployed based on the needs. Uh, the decentralized means that every part of the network, or at least not one part of the network, should be able to deploy those services based on, so it will not have like one central place where we should deploy services or let's say database where all services are listed. Every actor should be able to spawn another actor. If you if you remember the actor, actor model, basically every actor can create another actor. And another actor, which means you deploy a service. And orchestration is that all this, this kind of uh, capabilities enable will enable to create ad hoc subnetworks as backends for, for calls for applications from any like any place in, this, in, in, in the network. Uh, so decentralized searching and matching in the in the decentralized uh, the, the let's say the problem with the decentralized systems in general is that you have to find things that you want to run. It's not enough just to know what you want to run. And since there is no single place where you can just see all the like all the ground truth of what is happening to the network, which tells you where to run, how to run, so on and so forth. You basically have to search for fitting uh, algorithms to run. Uh, so, so when when services call other services, they have to search for the appropriate services to 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 sort of uh, answer the call. But services when they are called, uh, they have to search for appropriate hardware. And then all this sort of gets built into the structured, what can be called overlay subnetwork on top of the, the hardware software service mesh. Uh, so yeah, so the decentralization is that there is no central database which can tell, which can sort of list all the machines and all the services. And I will, if we will have time, I will sort of give the example. Now the some kind of basically the the. Mm, let's say to some extent the theoretical goal of all this is to be able to search and match software services and hardware for those services to run not based on concrete pointers to let's say service names but by defining what kind of work is needed to be done so that um, and this this is related to the cons to what Singularity Net basically is is, is building as a platform, so, and and or I mean concretely sub project which is called AI DSL at least it was called somewhere around a year ago AI DSL which is AI domain specific language which describe which allows uh, different AI agents to search for other AI services based on the description of what we need from them rather than name of the services itself, which allows the framework to kind of dynamically 
well, I mean, decentralized framework to evolve in a sense that everybody who will have uh, a wish or knowledge could uh, put better algorithms that could be dynamically searched and sort of plugged into all those those, those uh, computing graphs uh, without, uh, let's say, a certain human or whatever sort of, uh, scanning the network and searching for the best algorithms. If you have questions, please let me know because at this point I'm not even sure that I made sense with, with the last few sentences. So please ask questions if, if they are. Uh, so yeah, so the so goal of this is basically decentralized searching and matching is that we can construct computing workflows. So pretty much declarative definitions of what needs to be done rather than uh, direct, let's say, pointers to the functions. It's not very much related to the hardware because we are now, uh, I mean, uh, so hardware searching is slightly more, they have slightly more hard constraints and we first of all want to implement those hard constraints but there also will be soft constraints uh, where we will say what we prefer to do or what kind of hardware is preferred for the algorithms and either way, either way. and the sh so both machines and algorithms will have some sort of decision functions to decide whether they prefer this, this, this uh, execution environment or others or to let's say whether they prefer this kind of uh, subnetwork or another kind of subnetwork. Uh, now, okay, serverless decentralized orchestration platform. So basically, I will let explain. So orchestration platform is a system that provides control of high-level abstractions that define how deployment and life cycle management uh, semantics work. Decentralized means that okay, uh, execution of those orchestration tasks can be executed from many points within the system and, I mean, ultimately and hopefully at certain point from any point of the system. And serverless, that's the development model that allows to build and run applications, uh, yeah, without having having to manage servers explicitly and to have execution environments and to have anything running. Uh, so for that, now regarding P2P communication security, I just here describe why we need this. So since every actor in the network has the same level of uh, kind of network citizenship, or they are equal peers with uh, relation to each other, basically the, there is no higher authority in the network that can be trusted in terms of security, which means all the security and the communication sort of guarantees have to be established between those actors which communicate to each other, which, which just comes to peer-to-peer -peer communication and security. And since every actor and node makes its own decision whom to trust in the network and whom to ask whether this can be trusted, so yeah, again, we come to the peer-to-peer, -peer, let's say, uh, logic. Uh, our goal is, NUNA, NUNA as a platform goal, is to provide tools and protocols to enable these things but we do not provide guarantees themselves and also we do not provide global trust we should provide ability to encrypt everything but we will not sort of have any authority which will say yes this is correctly well, correctly encrypted we will have to say but let's say somebody where you will uh, ask whether let's say this kind of sub network is, is secure or not at the end of the day we want end-to-end -end encryption between peers uh, no global services and no central point of failure and every actor potentially can become a network hub due to let's say that it does stuff that it does well and the reputation which will be assigned by other peers but not by NUNET as a platform so NUNET will enable this kind of reputation to flow within the platform but it will not be responsible for doing that as, 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 as a kind of ultimate goal uh, and so kind of a this not a disclaimer but uh, yeah let's say comment on top of that is that in order to bootstrap the network uh, for sure we will need to build those services however those services will be i mean for example uh, yeah let's say hubs which will enable the, the, the platform to work so we will be building this in lunet but we will build this in a way so that community could propose and to rebuild those components and hopefully they will do that and that is again one of the goal of the, of the why we're doing the platform the way we're doing it is that basically ideally at certain point we want to take care only about the protocols and for example reputation systems should be built by the community and since every algorithm and every machine will be compensated through the NUNET economic system which we this is what we want to build 
basically people will be able to build let's say better copy, uh, better reputation systems better hubs better matching uh, algorithms which will get uh, rewarded for the work and that is our goal to enable people to build uh, components both application components and components which enable those applications to run on the net and just enable this economic flow between them rather than to build everything ourselves uh, now decentralized ownership is pretty much flows from uh, from from yeah from the idea of nunet is that every machine in the network can be owned or controlled by a different entity which is either like a person or in potentially a legal person also each algorithm or service deployed on nunet can be owned or controlled or will be owned by a different entity and our so our goal is basically to enable that, that anybody can join with a machine and it should not be vetted by the I mean, nunet and everybody who wants to run the algorithm should be able to make it into an actor. Uh, so NUNAT uh, does not aims not to keep track of personal information or not to keep personal information of owners of the machine of algorithms, but to encrypt everything so that it is this, this information is accessible only to the owners. However, it's not accessible to NUNAT platform itself. Uh, and KYC requirements, which may be based on all kind of uh, yeah legal legal requirements that uh, that we we will and we may and will be subject to, they will be implemented based on the nature of applications that run on Unit. And yeah, th this is a sort of uh, concept, but they should not be required by design. Uh, so another aspect that is needed to be sort of implemented in order to 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 make these concepts work is this what what we call pseudonymous identity management and authentication system, where uh, which so basically each actor will have to have a network identity in order for other actors to detect it. So basically, some kind of addressing scheme where they should be uniquely identifiable. However, that doesn't need to be related to any, let's say, physical identity or anything, and any tracking beyond from that, beyond of that. Uh, so, which means there will be no central authority which will know actors. And the ownership will be um, ownership or control, con controllership <laughs> Of, of these actors will basically established with some sort of cryptography or private key infrastructure type system without without external uh, trusted parties. So blockchain is a kind of a good example of how, how this works. Where you have uh, private keys and if you lose private keys you basically lose access and nobody can help anybody because there is no central authority. Unless Somebody creates such a central authority and provides it as a service, but then it's at, at the risk of, 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 of people who are doing this to trust them. Uh, Nunet itself, uh, as a platform, it will not do that. It will provide ability, but it will not uh, act as any kind of global trust system. Uh, so yeah, as I said, it, it kind of replicates the logic of blockchain identity and ownership management to some extent. Uh, so, and here is a kind of uh, scheme of how this this pseudonymous identity management authentication system uh, is structured, which means every machine will have one owner, but one owner can have many machines, and by having, let's say, um, these private keys of those machines, owner will have to have them. We should be able to search for those machines in the network. And to connect to them, and so that is related to the to the yeah to the device onboarding and management application. The same with algorithms. There will be one owner who will have uh, who can have many algorithms with data sources. As I said, uh, 
Conceptually, we don't really need to uh, separate data sources from algorithm because from the actor perspective, uh, I mean, the difference between uh, between algorithm and, 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 and data is that when you when an algorithm gets a message saying give me this and this response, it has to run something and it uses CPU and, and RAM and stuff like this, stuff like this, and time. And when you have uh, something written like a hash table written with this, the only thing that you need to do is to is to when you get a message re requesting certain response, you just check, read certain certain information from the disk and send it back. Outside of the of the um, I mean, outside of that, since we are not really conceptual, we don't care what's happening inside network as a platform, inside act actors as a platform, but rather how they communicate, basically this boils down to inputs and outputs. Therefore, on certain conceptual level, data sources and algorithms are pretty much actors. Machines are slightly different actors. All right, so these are the, now, the design and implementation is a good way to think about how we sort of approach the implementation of this is that we're building what we're building is what we call API of APIs or we define the functionality of the platform in you know by defining APIs uh, and these APIs apart from defining fun uh, functionalities of the platform they enable they also define how communication happens between actors and they also define uh, I mean between actors within the platform and also they define how communication between actors and internal external components for example blockchain or GUI or whatever external components we want to use uh, will interact with those actors uh, so this is a kind of uh, schematic representation of what is okay the, the first the first um, picture is an actor we have inputs and outputs and uh, the API basically all the APIs are exposed by what we call adapter right now it will turn into I think uh, device management service but let's let's see that as an adapter so API basically defines functions or yeah, remote, I mean, uh, we can we can name it in uh, the different, uh, we can sort of call it different names, remote procedure calls or messages or functions that can be run. Uh, but yeah, basically we have what kind of messages can be sent to uh, to an actor or to an adapter, what kind of messages an adapter can, can, can ingest and what kind of messages this adapter can send out. Uh, so, and these messages can be internal to the machine, which means between actors which are running in another machines and actors which are running in let's say current machine and that is pretty much it and this is what what was the, the definition of api is pretty much that what can i what kind of messages can i receive what kind of uh, functions these messages trigger within the actor and what kind of messages i can send out so i will come to that in a moment so this is a sort of conceptual stuff. I mean, conceptual picture of how how we define the functionalities is the goal would be to pretty much define everything that the platform can do in the form of these APIs. So uh, I believe now everybody heard and seen the list of APIs that we want to build. Right now we are working mostly on like, uh, mentioning tokenomics API, telemetry API, but then we have quite an extensive list and these these are let's say categories it's it's, it's usual for, for us to, uh, to cluster certain function calls into categories let's say tokenomics which means okay it, it deals with uh, with the blockchain and with the uh, with ability to pay to for for each actor to reward each other actor. also regarding the rewarding actually since since each actor will uh, will make a, a independent decision just a kind of side comment, which means that the way economy works is that, for example, uh, I, I am I am an algorithm which needs to run another twenty algorithms. Basically, I decide how much I will pay for them, and this is so the decision for for how much will be paid for the calls is made 
on the actor level again, which which makes every 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 actor, as, as was mentioned, a kind of equal citizen in the network. Uh, now, so the way we will be doing uh, and those APIs in order to kind of define this, this, this functionality, we will have to formally define APIs and to furthermore make clear connections between the code and those APIs, which, which we will do via CI CD pipelines and maybe even via enabling direct uh, um, compilation of the programs out of the API specifications. Uh, so here, the, uh, just after this, I think I will send I will send a link to the to the presentation. Uh, basically, we have a proposal how to do this, uh, and the APIs. Okay, I think I have to stop sharing the screen and share another one just to show slightly how it works. Uh, so basically, there is a proposal how we are going to do it. We will describe all APIs, economics, telemetry, etc., in appropriate repositories using the, this format, which is async API. If anybody has used it, uh, please shout loud because it will be important. Then we will compile documentation and publish this documentation about the, everything that we implement and is described in this API which will be available for the team and also for the for the community developers it will be public and we will develop everything based on those uh, apis and this will enable us to kind of develop different components uh, yeah so first of all we'll, the requirement will be to define all the functionality that we are implementing on the api yeah description uh, the next thing we'll try to sort of, it's not exactly try, but, uh, but we will uh, implement the testing of a flat platform based on those APIs into the CICD pipeline. Yeah, and then we will do the versioning of APIs because the platform, so the, the, the platform itself will um, develop by issuing new versions of APIs. And then the lifestyle life cycle of the whole platform will be the life cycle of, of releasing API descriptions and managing, uh, let's say, backwards compatibility between those APIs. Uh, so the sample specification of, of an API, which is just, uh, I think, a few functions of the tokenomics API, is pretty much like this. And from those files, we'll have this, this kind of files for each, for each API. Uh, from those files, we basically should be able to know exactly what is needed for each call, what, uh, what information is needed to make a call, and what information, uh, what kind of payload, uh, format, etc., and so on and so forth. So this thing relates to basically telemetry API and all the formats of the calls that I think are in, in some of the issues that are being, being solved by the team right now. Uh, and the last thing is that this kind of specification, okay, I just, just want to show off that this, this sort of, uh, this kind of specification, it compiles to the documentation of API. And we will publish it, and this documentation will be sort of ground ground truth for, for, for the development. Uh, and I believe, uh, the second that this would be the end of presentation. Thank you, Kabir. Uh, I, I have a, a specific question about the communication between NUNET nodes. Will the communication between NUNET nodes always be through the NUNET adapter running yes. in the nodes? Yes. Uh, for, for instance, if a NUNET node running an algorithm need to reach some data in another NUNET node, will this communication be done through the adapters of these two nodes? Yes. Okay. So, uh, in a sense, I, I said that we will not, I mean, the, the, this security guarantees, encryption, etc., and so on and so forth, we will provide this via adapters. So the, the basically all the APIs will be implementation will be exposed via adapter. Yes. 
between the machines. Okay, thank you. And, and then, uh, I mean, there will be other actors, let's say algorithms, so some, some of those APIs will be exposed to them. But between the machines, everything should work through the adapt. Otherwise, we cannot guarantee anything. Kabir, I had one question. Will there be a mechanism in place uh, for user preference uh, when, uh, in order to like uh, auto prioritize hardware based on the performance capability uh, when searching on the network? Yes. Like, uh, yes. for example, if an application's performance is dependent on a specific set of uh, minimum requirements. So, so that is a goal. Uh, it, 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 it is a kind of a small kind of, of worms in the sense that um, that what it requires, it requires decentralized search. Yeah. Uh, this kind of decentralized search and match, but basically, yes. And it is, uh, these things in decentralized systems, they are not uh, deterministic. But yeah, that's exactly what we want to provide. We want to provide ability for the algorithms to sort of have a, some kind of choice or some kind of decision function that they can run themselves in order to figure out on what hardware they would. They would. And the, the kind of simple example would be, I mean, one thing that we have implemented in, in the, on the private alpha, uh, on the private alpha is uh, that a machine, when a machine is onboarded, it can, it can sort of say whether it has a preference to run uh, public Cardano node. Uh, and we can imagine that there are others, other kind of uh, other scenarios. For example, an algorithm may say that may have the kind of uh, in the metadata description may have a constraint that it can run only on the machines which are powered by green energy or they have certain uh, geographical, let's say, place or whatever. And yes, we will have we will implement those decision functions to choose, but they will be implemented on each actor separately. There will be basically no global orchestration. Thank you.